right, good morning, everybody. Great to have you in church. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. It was an angel. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, Amen. for he is risen Amen. as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Jesus is alive. for that. Now, every Sunday we celebrate here at our church the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, but especially on Easter Sunday. It's kind of like those of you like football, it's like the Super Bowl part of the Christian life, right? And I don't want to degrade the Christian life by comparing it to the Super Bowl, but my point would be we're here to have a good time in the Lord and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're not putting on a performance. We're here for Jesus to have the preeminence. You know what that means? We want him to be in the spotlight, him to be in the focal point. If you're a guest here today, can I just give you one word? Relax. All right? Meaning that, honestly, we want you to just be able to enjoy the service. And if someone invited you, you came as their guest, you have made their day. I guarantee it. And so we're here to just let God talk to us in our heart. If you're not used to being in church, we're just 
typical South Jersey people. Most of us are normal. I don't, I don't know. If you see somebody near you doesn't look normal, I'm not taking credit for that. But most of you, we're just normal, typical cheesesteak eating South Jersey pretzel company. Berlin auction is the best. Uh, South pretzel. So that's how we roll, all right? How many of you had your coffee this morning? You're in the co- how many of you did not have your coffee? You look a little bitter. All right, get over that. And we're just here uh, to honor the Lord. So would you stand, my brother? And he is going to come and lead us in some singing. If you don't know the words, hum along, whatever. Don't worry about it. We won't stretch you out. This first song is awesome. It's called Christ Arose. And if you want to sing it with all your heart, raise the roof. Even if you're not a great singer, lift your voice. Here we go. Lord. singing appreciate everybody being here today and we want God to talk to us in our heart we don't want to just you know check box did church so we kind of feel good about ourselves we want the Lord to really touch our heart my dad's going to come and lead us in prayer and want to be praying um, Joe Hernandez on Friday went to be with the Lord and he had been in hospice care he's been dealing with lung cancer for a long time Joe's been tough he's fought against it but uh, he died on Friday But I'll say this, for the Christian, absent from the body is present with the Lord. And so that's a good thing. Uh, Aaliyah is here today. Aaliyah, raise your hand. And Elijah is here today. And that's uh, Joe's children. He has two more. And then Vicki, his wife. So you be praying that God will give them a special grace at this time. We're going to be praying for all that's going on with our services. We ran our buses in this morning. So there's a whole lot of kids and teens on the other side. We've got deaf church going on on the other side, Spanish church going on the other side, and we already had our 8 o'clock service. So we had a lot going on in here today, and uh, I was here at 5 a.m. shouting in the auditorium and uh, just praising the Lord a little bit, right, just, just to have a good time in church. You are allowed to have a good time in church, just so you know. Smile and be happy and let, let the Lord talk to you. So we're going to have prayer. This is Pastor Clark, and he founded our church in 1981, a long time ago. When he said most of us are normal, he looked right at me. Just kind of, we'll talk about that later. Anyway, it's good to see you all this morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord. 
And uh, let me just say thank you to all people live streaming. And you don't have to be in church to get saved. Remember that. So let's pray the Lord. Father in heaven, our God, we're very thankful today that we can be here. Thankful that we have the Bible, the Word of God, and have the truth. Thank you that you love us and you have a mercy on our souls. I pray that you'll bless here today. I pray for your presence. I pray that everybody will know you're here, and I pray you'll speak in our hearts. We ask you this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. lifeless body in the grave, hearts bathed in anguish for three days, but he
That is awesome. Thank God he's alive. Stand if you would. 147 in your book, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Charles Wesley wrote this hymn hundreds of years ago. He knew God. We sing hallelujah to our Jesus. Here we go. Christ the Lord is risen today. singing you can be seated if you're our guest today we're especially glad that you're here with us and not sure how you heard about the church maybe someone invited you you got a mailer or facebook or whatever but however it came to be that you're here we're glad you're here I want you to make yourself at home as best you possibly can we love to give you what we call a response card ask you to fill that out and as you leave the ushers will be standing at the back and you can just pass it off to one of them so I'm not going to ask you to give a speech or stand up or anything, but if you don't, you get a free pen. Come on now. There's not much left in life that's free, but you get a free pen out of it. If you are here for the first time or here just once in a while, would you raise your hand just high enough? The men are going to go through super quickly. These guys are fast. They're going to get you one of these. And if you don't mind, again, just fill it out. And when you leave, there'll be ushers at the back doors. Just pass it off to one of them. And that's wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're trying to get to everybody as quickly as we can. And then ushers, as you're, uh, we have some seats down towards the front. That's what's different about church. You go to the ball game, everybody pays for the premier seats. And at church time, we don't fill those up all the way. So you ushers, uh, when we get a moment here, we can just bring some folks down in front. If you'd like to do that, that would be wonderful. Uh, our church, I think we got everybody covered, all of our guests. Good, good, good. And then if some of you who are here all the time want to take some of these down in front to lay, open that up for some people, that would be great. Um, we are a Bible-believing church. We're an independent Baptist church. What that means is we, we don't have a denomination that sends us money. We don't take any money from the government. So I'm just letting you know this in case you're a guest. When we talk about our offering, we didn't bring you here for a shakedown, all right? So if you're our guest, you don't have to worry about it. If you want to give in the offering, that's fine. But everything you see here on this property, including the property itself, is because our church members through the years, we give what we call our tithes and our offerings to God. 
and that's how we pay for everything. Everything that goes on is part of our ministry. Our ministry is seven days a week, and so I'm just explaining that. So in our service time every week, we take time to mention our offering. Giving is not what we have to do. It's what we get to do, and it's part of our worship for God, and God says he loves the cheerful giver. If you like to give online, you can do that, and if you're not registered for online giving but would like to be, you can go to solidrockinfo.org. You could give it to an usher if you like to. As you leave, they'll be standing there at the back. Some people mail it in or bring it by during the week, but we're going to pray now for the offering and ask God to bless it. Father, I pray that you would bless our offering today, and Lord, I pray that you would bless each person who gives. I pray you'd help them, take care of them, and meet their needs. And Lord, I pray for this church. You've always met our needs here, and we thank you for it, and I pray you continue to do that. And Lord, I pray especially for the furtherance of the gospel that you would meet the need here at the church. I pray for people struggling, people that need a job or a new job. Uh, Lord, some here on fixed income, I pray that you take care of them and give them the uh, supply that they need. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. In our church, when someone has trusted Christ as their own personal Lord and Savior, uh, after someone gets saved, uh, oftentimes someone will get baptized. Now, some of you are used to uh, a baby christening, but in the Bible, people first believed and then they were baptized. So they put their faith and trust in Christ, which meant they were old enough to understand. And baptism does not help a person get to heaven, all right? Baptism just shows on the outside that a person is not ashamed of what Jesus has done for them on the inside. So, for instance, I wear my wedding ring. If I don't have my ring on, I'm still married, but the ring shows I'm not ashamed of my wife. So when you see someone get baptized, they're in the water there. It's like a picture of the cross as they're sitting there with the surface and then them out of it. They go under the water. That's a picture of the burial of Jesus. And then come up, it's actually a picture of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And we have a couple of young people who have trusted Christ and wanted to be baptized today. So Pastor Clark's going to do that at this time. All right. This is Thomas and his sisters here today, Amelia. And uh, they have trusted Christ as their Savior. And they've come to follow the Lord in believers' baptism. Brother Charlie was eight when he was saved. Thomas is nine. Thomas, upon your profession of faith, if you put both hands up, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death and risen to walk in newness of life. And this is Amelia. Take your time. We don't want to lose you. All right. Amelia, how old are you? Twelve? All right. She's got her nose, hands on her nose already. <laughs> Amelia, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death and risen in newness of life. God bless you. The God is the Lord commanded. All right, we're going to stand one more time if you're able and willing. And uh, 150, if you'd like to use the songbook, 150, he lives. We'll sing verse number one and verse number three. 150. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear voice of cheer and just the time I need him he's always near he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way he lives he lives salvation to Rejoice, rejoice, oh Christian.
moment. I know we're from South Jersey, but we can still be nice and friendly, right? Shake hands with somebody near you, next to you. Meet somebody, greet somebody before we continue on in here. morning. You may be seated. Again, so glad to see you in church, and uh, we thank the Lord that we serve a risen Savior. It had been three days since he died on the cross. What could this mean? All hope seemed lost, but hope had just been Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, family. Appreciate that song. Please turn to the Word of God to the Gospel of John. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Now, if you don't have a Bible, there's one there in the songbook rack. I would love for you to grab one of those and go to page 932. And when you get to 932, you should be on the same page with where I'm at. And if you're not, 
Then we're going to blame Brother Chad. He's the guy at the back that sent me that page number. So it's 932 on the page number. We're in the Gospel of John. John is the fourth book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And we are a Bible-believing church. We're a Bible-preaching church. And we're going to talk about that here in just a moment. So I'm glad that you've made it here today. And let me just go on record. Some of you mamas here spent the morning trying to put kids together. Hallelujah. I know kids are already assembled, but you know what I mean. All the stuff that goes with them. And some of you have been doing that all morning. It's, you look calm right now, pretty calm, but it's been hectic. And I appreciate all your efforts with all of that. Right now they're in a, a classroom, a lot of them. And then just think, later on they're going to have a candy scramble and they'll have all that sugar, they'll be fired up, and then they'll eventually crash. So you moms will get a nap at some point here later on. And so for now, just try to relax. And they're taking great care of the children for those that have children over there. If you have a little one in here and they start getting loud and kind of competing with me for who can preach the loudest, we do have the main lobby there and over to my left, the reception room areas where it'd probably be a little bit better for them to do that. Now let me encourage you in this sense. The devil hates the fact that you came to church today. He, he's not happy that you're here, and especially with what we're going to do right now, because we're going to open up the Bible, and the Bible is the Word of God. And the Bible can change your life. It's changed my life, and we want to learn something from the Bible today. I don't want you to just come and, you know, all right, I did that. But no, to really get something from the Bible is just an amazing thing. But when you're here in church, you can get really distracted with just all kinds of things, like your cell phone, hallelujah, or whatever, you know, people drive by and wave at the window or something. Just ignore all that kind of stuff and just kind of maybe calm a little bit with whatever you got going on, you got cooking and all that. Just that's later on. For right now, let's all do our very best just to really respect God, respect God's word, and just try to concentrate. I know people talk about, well, children's attention span is getting shorter all the time, but so are the adults. Help us. <laughs> and so we're going to go into the Bible. I have a prayer, and then we're going to just jump right in, and we want the Word of God to speak to us, all right? If you're not used to hearing the Bible preached, then I would just encourage you, even if you're not sure if you believe it, listen and see what God does in your heart today. And I think God could give you something. Let's pray. Father, I pray for Spanish church going on. I pray you bless deaf church. I pray for the three junior churches that are going on. I pray you bless all of those. Help the people preaching in those. Pray for the young children's classes that you'd bless them. Be with the nursery. Lord, put a hedge of protection about all of it. Thank you for our teachers here that help with all of these. I pray that you would bless churches all around the world today that still preach the Bible. And wherever Christians assemble today, I pray that you give them something from the Word of God. And for those of us here in this auditorium, Lord, I pray that you would move in our hearts. And God, I pray that the sweet spirit of God would teach us and convince us of the truth of Scripture here this morning. I pray for people that maybe have never read the Bible or aren't acquainted with it. Lord, I pray that you would make it to make sense. Lord, I pray you would hide me behind the cross. Lord, I'm just the mouthpiece. I pray most importantly that you would speak to people's hearts. And we praise you. We'll give you all the glory and the honor for it. And we pray in Christ's precious and holy and wonderful name. Amen. In John chapter 20, I'd like you to look at verse 30 and verse 31. John 20, verse 30 and 31. And I would like you to notice here, the Bible says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Now, when I talk about the Bible, let me explain just a few things. God used men to pen down the words of the Bible. God gave men the words of the Word of God. It'd be kind of like if I asked somebody, hey, would you write this down for me, where it was my words, but it was them actually inscripting it and putting it down. That process in the Word of God is called inspiration. The idea that God gave the words that we now have in the Bible. God gave those words, and he did it through this process called inspiration. 
All right, so everybody help me. How did God give the words for the process called inspiration, where he moved on men's hearts to know what it was that they were to put down? That's called inspiration. Now, God not only gave inspiration for the word of God, but he gave preservation. Preservation is the idea that God has kept his word. Last night, my uncle, my uncle Jimmy in here, I'm not sure if he's not here right now, but he sent a picture to my dad, my brother, and me of a shotgun shell that had already been shot and came out of a shotgun. And he said, when I killed my first deer, your father saved this. He picked it up and gave it to me. And he pulled it out of some box, took a picture of it last night. Now, if you're against hunting, just act like you didn't hear all that. But those of you that don't mind, it was a cool sentimental memory that he had this. I said, it's a relic. And it's 54 years old, he said. And uh, he's a relic. But the idea would be it's something old and it's been kept. Well, when you think about the Bible, the Word of God, over the course of 6,000 years of world history, God has not only given His Word, but God has preserved His Word. He's kept it for us, and it's in the Bible. So you say, man, you keep talking about the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. Absolutely. Because what do I have to give you that's really worth anything if it's just my thoughts or my ideas? You don't need to hear what I think. You need to hear what God said. So that's why we have a Bible in every pew. That's why we have a Bible in the front of the pulpit. We've got a Bible up in the stained glass windows. It's Bible, Bible, Bible everywhere because the Bible is the Word of God. So God gave it by inspiration. He's kept it by preservation. Now the Bible's broken up into 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, a total of 66. So all of these books come together as one to comprise, to make up the Scripture. And that's the book you hold in your hand. The Bible is the Word of God. So John, this Gospel of John, forgive me if my voice sounds, uh, these flowers are wonderful, but these lilies, they, I'm, I'm decorated in pollen up here. So I, I already preached 8 o'clock service. I've been sucking pollen for three hours. And uh, so if, if my voice gives out, that's just happening. So John... We're in the Gospel of John. So the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they are accounts about the life of Jesus. So John was a good man. John was a fisherman. In northern Galilee, there's called the Sea of Galilee. Some of you guys that like to fish would like it there. Around the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, you had all of these coastal towns. 2,000 years ago, there's one there called Bethsaida. And John was from there, and some of his friends were from there, and Jesus was raised not far from there. So he came to the shores of Galilee, and he's teaching, he's preaching, and at some point, John had been told by Jesus, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Instead of fishing for fish, he was going to be in the ministry with Jesus. And so John was somebody that loved Christ. He's known as John the Beloved, and we're in his gospel. And that means God used him to give account. Now, I know this, sometimes, especially as you get older, you don't remember as well as you did. Some of you have what I think I have, COVID fog, if you've ever heard of that. Maybe it's just I'm getting old, but I don't remember everything I'd like to remember. And sometimes memories slip away. Uh, Vanessa and Jeffrey, they had their anniversary. Jeffrey's my son-in-law, Vanessa's my daughter, on Friday. And Vanessa sent me a picture from four years ago it was the night before she was going to get married. It was during COVID when it had just started in March of 2020. So she got married, I guess, the 28th or 29th, whatever that is. And so Vanessa likes steak. She's the carnivore in the family. She sees steak. She just consumes it. And uh, she's been that way. I think we cut it up for her bottle when she was a baby that way. But it was the night before she could get married. It's her and I having this last meal. And every restaurant was shut down, sealed tight, except for it to go. You have, some of you are getting PTSD. Relax, right? Your flashbacks. Like, no! And that's what was happening. So I took the vans out of, the, the seat out of my brother's van. I got one of the little round tables from our coffee shop here. I got regular steak knives, the whole bit, and put the chairs in there, decorated the van. And we went over to Philadelphia, the Capitol Grill. Some of you got, you woke up on that one, right? Mm. And uh, got it to go. And we sat on Broad Street in the back of the van. And we had Vanessa's last steak dinner before she got married. There in the back of the van, you know, classical music playing. It was the best I could do, right? And for the effort. She sent me that memory in a picture 
on Friday, uh, on her anniversary day, just the memory of it. And I thought, and I said to her, I should have kept a journal. I don't remember everything that's going on. When I was like 30, my father said, you need to keep a journal, and I didn't do it. Uh, someday I'll write a book. I should have listened to my dad. <laughs> Amen. All right. I, I, although I have my whole 56 years, but I didn't it on that one, and I truly regret it. Because as the years click by, you don't remember it all. But God allowed with John, who was living at the time of Christ, and God worked in his heart to be able to put these things in the Bible. Now, why did I say all that? Because I want you to go back and notice verse 30 in John chapter 20. And I want you to pick up on what John is saying. Think about it. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So he is giving the gospel of John, but he's saying, man, there was all kinds of stuff that was going on day to day. John and the other disciples, they were with Jesus for three and a half years. I don't know if you know that or not. Jesus was born at age 30. He started his earthly ministry. It lasted around three and a half years before he was crucified. So the disciples, they're traveling with him. They're rubbing shoulders. And there are all kinds of things that happen that Jesus did that John did not include in this gospel. Now you say, well, why not? Why didn't he put it all in there? Well, jump across your page here and look at chapter 21, John chapter 21, the last chapter in the gospel of John. And notice what he said in verse 24 and 25. This is the, this is the disciple which testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. John's like, I'm not lying. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, similar to chapter 20, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So here's John. He's saying, listen, I didn't get everything in this gospel of John. He said, really? I suppose, I think that if we try to put everything Jesus did in a book that all the world couldn't contain how many books it would take to talk about the life of Jesus. So we do have some of these things that John did include and in his gospel that God wanted there to be kept and preserved in his word. Now, I want you to go to John chapter 20 and go back to verse 31 again, please. I know I'm bouncing you back and forth a little bit there, but I want you to see the purpose for which God gave John the gospel of John, the story of Jesus's life, according to John's viewpoint, now he experienced it. In John chapter 20, verse 31, there's four things I want you to notice here. Number one, here's why it was written, but these are written that she, help me church, what's the next two words? Might believe. One more time. These are written that she might what? Believe. So John gave these words, God gave these words to John, and we find them in the Bible, and they are written that she might believe. As I've already said, I'm not here giving a sales pitch here today. I'm preaching the Bible. The Bible when you get into it, the more you get into the Bible, the more the Bible will get into you. You say, well, I'm not even sure if I believe the Bible. Can I go on record and say this to you kindly? You owe it to yourself to get into the Bible and to find out what it says so that you might come to the point of doing what John said this was written for, that she might believe, that she might believe. We're in an age, and I understand it completely, where people have come to the point where they don't really hardly trust anything or anyone. Can I get a witness right there? Man, it is a crazy world. Well, it's on the internet. Well, God have mercy. We know that doesn't mean a blessed thing. Well, it was in the news. Well, you don't know. Well, science. I and mean, oh my goodness, you know, and I'm not here trying to be conspiratorial. Don't, don't get all worked up with it. I'm just saying, I'm just saying it's hard to validate things. It's hard to know what is truth. But when you go to the Bible and you read it, here's where, as I said earlier, I'm not just depending on me. I'm just the mailman. I'm just the instrument from which the word of God is coming to you today by voice. But when you get into the Bible, God's Holy Spirit 
will work in your spirit to confirm in your heart that it is the true word of God and you'd come to believe it. I can't make you believe anything. You can't make me believe. It is your individual choice to believe the Bible or not. I met with someone this week and I was trying to talk to them about how they can know they're going to heaven and from the Bible, from the Word of God. And we were talking and it was someone who watched a video that I've done here and others have helped me with that is a video presentation of the gospel. And I sat there and we watched it together. When it was over, the person said to me, I have doubts and questions. Well, you know what? There's nothing wrong with questions. And if you have doubts, the way to settle your doubts or learn how not to doubt is to get into the Bible itself. And the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. By the way, we as a church have no problem. Uh, you know, any of you that ever want to just sit down and, and get into the Bible and you bring your questions and the person I was speaking with mentioned a couple of questions. Well, I'm planning to answer them as best I can. I'm not the world's greatest Bible teacher or preacher or theologian, but I can go to the Bible. I can find the answers and I want to be able to answer the questions. If you're here with questions, that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But then you want to do your homework and go ahead and research and find out the answers from the Word of God. Amen. And John's saying here, look, I have been given these words by God that you might, first of all, believe. Now, notice num uh, number two, what we are to believe, but these are written, that means we have the Bible because that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, the thing that we are to believe is that Jesus is the Christ. You say, what does it mean that Jesus is the Christ? That word, the Christ, is the idea of Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah, okay? Or we could use this term, the anointed one. We could just say it this way, he's the Savior. Jesus is Messiah. He is the Christ. Now, that is very important because all through the Old Testament Bible history, Genesis through Malachi... We have prophecy about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he came. And there's more prophecies now that point to the future. And so the Bible is this book and its purpose is to teach you that Jesus is the Christ. Now, there are what you would call antichrists throughout history. At some point in time, there will be, because maybe you don't even know the Bible, but you've heard of this, the idea of an antichrist. It will be a world ruler. You say, is that in the Bible? Absolutely. You say, when's that happening? Uh, bluntly, in my opinion, sooner than what you would imagine. Amen. Now, the idea would be that there are antichrists or people that are including anti and meaning against Christ. But there is only one true Christ. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There's no one like our Jesus. There's no one like the Jesus of the Bible. So the Bible is given that we would believe and that we would believe specifically that Jesus is the Christ. And then notice thirdly what we're to learn from this verse. Jesus is the Christ. And then notice what it says here, the Son of God, the Son of God. And my message today is from this verse, Jesus is the Christ the Son of God. That's very simple. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, if you think about it, all right, I have three daughters. Maybe you have children. When children are born, and my children were born, I, I didn't, uh, we, we didn't have a giraffe, okay? Uh, we, we didn't have a, a, a shark. When the children were born, they were human beings. Why? Human beings produce Human beings, that makes sense, right? Now, when you think about God and Jesus calling himself the Son of God, and that's what he's called in the Word of God, the Son of God, you have Jesus who comes from God. He is God. He comes from God. He is the Son of God. The idea is this. He's deity, okay? He is God. And many, and I would dare suggest all false religions, they fail, most fail 
to recognize Jesus as God. Now, in this current world, you can talk about the God of your choice. You can talk about any form of God. I could say this is the Easter lily God, and there would be some people, well, if that's what you believe, good for you. And there's all different takes on all the different things that are God. You know, pantheism, God is in nature, nature is in God. So if you want to pray to the flowers, go ahead and pray to the flowers. Whatever. The point would be this. I don't pray to flowers. I don't pray to statues. I pray to God because God is real, and Jesus is the Son of God. And there's a reason people in the world today, they take issue with Christ. I was looking at ties on, I don't know, Thursday or Friday, and we were at the mall, which I don't go to very often, thank the Lord, but I was there, and I had two men come up to me and begin to talk to me, just randomly. I'm just sitting there, and a the guy walks up, and, hey, what's your name? And I, I spoke to him, gave my name, and uh, I, he's, well, I'd like to show you some things about God, our Father, and God our mother. And, and I, I kind of thought, okay, this is interesting. Why me? Like, Lord, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trying to pick out a tie, right? And I'm there, and this man begins to go through all of what he believed. He had his phone, and he's starting to go through, and he's telling me this and that and the other. And I, I won't get into all of it, but he started with, let us make man our own image, male and female created in them. He went to Galatians with some other things. He had an NIV that was difference with me and him. So he had his helper there, and this guy's pretty confident. It was a mix of, he called it the law of Christ in contrast to the Mosaic law. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. You're not going to miss a thing right here. But the thought would be this. He's telling me all these things, and I'm just quoting Scripture to him and his partner there. And after a while, he said, what, what's your profession? <laughs> and I, I said, I'm a pastor. And so then, then, he, then he stiffened up a little bit. Uh, because typically when people have a mentoree that they're trying to train about how to talk to people, they don't really want to be, you know, you come too strong. But the thing I was coming strong about is you don't get to heaven by religion, Baptists included. You don't get to heaven by what you do for God. You get to heaven by putting your faith in what God did for you. He gave Jesus to die on Calvary's cross, and the only way to get to heaven is through Christ alone. And Jesus is not your homeboy, as the T-shirt says. You know, Jesus is my homeboy. No, Jesus is King of kings. Jesus is Lord of lords. There's nobody like Jesus. And the world can bow up, and Satan tried to stop him from going to the cross and actually put him on the cross. Pastor Clark made you happy there. Listen, hey, Jesus Christ, he is the one who rose from the dead that we celebrate today. He's alive and well. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's coming back again, and people can do whatever they want. They can say whatever they want, but they cannot change the fact that Jesus Jesus Christ is Lord. That's fact. Fact. He's the Son of God. Now, I want you to notice the last thing. I told you four things here. When I say the last thing, don't get too excited like the message is over. It's not. And you regulars, don't tell the visitors, all right? Here's the thought. Notice verse 31 one more time. We said these are written that you might believe, right? So that's the first part of it. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more you hear the Bible, the more you'd believe the Bible. Number two, we said we want to specifically believe that Jesus is the Christ. There's only one Savior, and it's him. He's anointed to be the Savior. Number three, we're going to learn and believe that he's the Son of God. And then lastly, from this verse, I wanted you to see this, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Now, you think life, you think breathing. And how many of you are glad you're breathing? Would you say amen right there, right? Life is good. And we, we're, we're breathing here in this life. We have, when we think life, we look at a human being, and we can know that their heart is uh, pumping here, and, and, and their lungs are breathing, and they're alive. That's physical life. But physical life here on this earth in this current body does not last forever. I mentioned the Hernandez family, and they're here, and Vicki came in, and she was there when her husband on Friday took his last breath physically. 
Thank God, Vicki. <laughs> Thank God. Here's what the Bible says. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. Present with the Lord. I don't know if you've ever watched someone pass, but I have, and, and I've been with people when they've died, and when that soul leaves the body, what's left is just this physical body. We'd call it typically the corpse. And, and I'll be very honest, when you're in that situation, you've ever been part of it, when that soul leaves the body, that life, that, that body is just lifeless. The body itself. And then we bury the body. We don't bury the person. Why? Because the soul has left the body. You just ultimately are burying the body. And you say, what's that got to do with anything? It's Easter Sunday. I thought this was happy. It is in this sense. Because when you look at verse 31, you don't have to dread the end of your physical life if you truly know that you have eternal life. Amen. Well, that's a figment of imagination. That's just a feel-good tool that you preachers use to give people hope about a hereafter. No, 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 no. Please, 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 please. Go to the Bible and read it, and for yourself, Jesus talked about, taught about, preached about a place called heaven. In John 14, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. He said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So he taught about heaven. This may come as a shocker to you. He taught more about hell than he did about heaven. Well, South Jersey's hell. No, it's not, all right? I may get rough at times. I know your property taxes are killing you, but this is not hell. Because when you look in the Bible and what hell was and is, the Bible indicates it's in the heart of the earth, the middle of the earth. Heaven, we believe, is in the north. you got the first heaven where the birds fly. Second heaven where the sun, moon, the stars are. The third heaven is where God lives. And the Bible calls it a city. And that's a real thing. Now, here's the thought with all of this. When you look at verse 31 and you think about why do we have the Bible, it's so that we would believe to know who Jesus is. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And that when you believe that and believe in his name. Now, please hear me, church. That belief is not just knowing and giving mental assent to the fact that there was a man named Jesus who lived in Israel. All right, I, I take trips to Israel by the grace of God, and uh, we go there, and you go to the place where he was born, Christ, where he grew up, where he died, and, and, and a garden tomb that's empty. Thank God I've been in it, no bones there. Amen. So here's the thought, that Jerusalem, that Israel, that place where Jesus lived, even people that don't believe in what Jesus said about himself know historically that the man lived. So it's not just, oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Ben Franklin and George Washington and that they were there in Independence Hall there. And I believe, you know, historically Abraham Lincoln. And, but I'm not trusting them. To believe means to put your faith in, to put your confidence in. I'm standing up here on this, what I call preaching box, right? And it was made by some uh, people from Amish country here, and the thing can hold anything. And I jump up and down here, and I, I've got confidence in it. But right now, I'm the only one that's really believing that it can hold me up because I'm standing on it. Make sense? You didn't think about that seat you sat on. I wonder if this will hold me up. You just plopped down on it, and it did, which thank the Lord. And here's the thought, right? You have a belief, a trust. It's not just knowing, it's trusting. It's trusting. And when you come to the point where you're willing to trust Christ with your eternal destiny, that is what it truly means to believe in Christ. And the devil's plot and plan has been and continues that in our nation, we get rid of the Bible so that people would never come to know the truth about who Jesus is. It was a bad day in American history when they kicked the Bibles out of the public school system as compared to like when my dad was growing up and every day it was there. And here's the point. We now have raised decades and decades, a generation, generations plural, of intelligent people who've gotten great educations but have never been taught the Word of God. Did you know that theology was called the queen of the sciences? Do you understand Princeton, all these Ivy League schools, all started based upon 
training preachers and then evolved into the other things that they've now become famous for. And there's been this attack by the devil to make people ignorant of the Bible because the Bible is truth. And when you learn the truth, the Bible says it sets you free. And the devil's not about freedom. The devil's about captivity. He wants to keep you in chains. He wants to make you think, boy, if I could just make a little bit more money, if we could just get a little bit bigger house, boy, if we could just give a little bit more, and man, if the kids are taken care of, we live out this American dream, we work like dogs, we do what we do, you get to the end, you hope you don't get cancer and aneurysm or something along the way, and then you die. Well, let me just tell you something, all right? God's got a whole lot of better plan than the American dream. And the idea is that there would be a time in your life when you stop trusting in you and stop living for just the here and now and come to understand there's a God in heaven who loves you so much that he gave his son, Christ Jesus, the son of God, to come to this world to live and to be crucified and then raised from that grave. He did it all for you. If you've been the only person that had ever lived, Christ would have died for you. You say, well, why would he have to die for me? Watch this, because we're all sinners. Yes. You say, what is sin? Anything you do that's wrong. And you don't have to teach us how to sin. Come on now. Some of you are raising two-year-olds. You don't have to teach them, Brother Charlie, they're so beautiful, they're so innocent. Well, they're beautiful, but they ain't innocent. Yeah, yeah, come on. You, if you don't believe that, go over to the nursery right now. Yeah. You say, what's that? Man, there could be 50 toys. And, and that kid could play with any one. But he's going to look over at that other one there and see if the other kid's got it. And they're going to crawl over there. They're going to lean into that kid's hand. Not your kid. And, hunk, and take a chunk out. No, I'm one kid. We have nursery workers to protect them from other little sinners in the nursery. <laughs> come on. And that's how it is. You say, where does that come from? It's almost like it's in your nature. It is. Adam, the first man, was created. God said, look, you can have all the fruit of the garden. You can have anything you want. There's one tree. Don't eat it. So you know what Eve did? And then she gave to Adam. They went over. Man, took that bite from the fruit. Genesis teaches this. And sin came into the world. And the sin nature started with Adam. It's passed to us through our fathers. And we're all sinners. Now, if you, when I was young and did wrong, my mom was old school. There was no time out. There was whooped up. And, and, and some of you know all about that. Maybe you got it. Maybe you didn't. Those of you that didn't, it, we can tell. But I, 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 was, I, was, I was there. And uh, he said, why don't you talk about your dad was spanking? He said, my dad, he, he, he spanked pretty good. But mom was out of control. All right? And, and that's how it was. And, and she'd spank me. And then you go to school, you get in trouble. Some of you have been to the principal's office. I know you don't want your kids to know, but you were there. And at some point, you went to the principal's office. Listen, you break the law. Sometimes you got to go before the judge. Here's the point. There's always punishment for doing wrong. Now, here's reality. God's not up in heaven with some long white beard down to his knees. Just like, oh, I can't really see what's going on. God knows everything you've ever done. He knows everything I've ever done. Not only that, he knows what we've thought, what we felt. There's nothing you can hide from God. So you can't look and say, well, I just hope he gives me a pass. God is not your grandpa. Are you with me? God is God. Amen. Well, I thought he's loving. Oh, he is, but he's also just. That means this, if, the right if my dad were the judge and I went before him and I had broken the law, if he's the right type judge, even if I'm his son, he has to execute the punishment that the law says. You say, why? Because justice demands that. God is a just God. So yes, he's loving, but he can't look at all of our sin and just act like it's never happened. Because God is holy, perfectly holy. He's never sinned one time. He sees the sin in our life. He has to judge it. God's punishment, God's judgment for sin, according to the Bible, I didn't write it, I'm just delivering it, is that when we would die, if we die in our sins, with them unforgiven, with them unconfessed, the Bible says the punishment for sin is death and hell. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Revelation 21 eight says, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, how many lies does it take to make you a liar? Just one. And everybody here, if I said, have you ever lied in your life? If you didn't raise your hand, you'd be lying in church. 
and absolutely, right? All have lied. That means this. It only takes us one sin to make us guilty. And as a sinner, I deserve hell according to the Bible. And that's the bad news. But here's the good news. Christ came to earth, a.k.a. the Christ. He came as, watch, the Son of God. And here's what's different about Jesus. Jesus doesn't have, did not have, does not have a sin nature. Remember how we talked about through our father, Adam, going back with the first man, is passed to us. The sin. Aren't genetics amazing? And how that's passed to you, different things are passed to you. And people understand that. I, I was talking to my uncle this week. And he's had trouble through the years with his legs and veins. And my grandmother had that same problem, his mom. And I'm having some of the same trouble. And I'm thinking, you know what? Good old genetics. And it's passed through. But we don't, we, we rarely take time to understand that just like there's genetics from fathers on other things, there's also sin nature passed to us. And that's a problem because sin is our disease. Sin is our sickness that we're all plagued with. But Christ came and was born, for those of you that have heard about the Virgin Mary, Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. What's the virgin thing? What was that all about? How could that happen and why did that happen? Here's why. I just already said our sin nature is passed through us through our earthly father. Christ did not have an earthly father. Supernaturally, God allowed Mary, supernaturally, a miracle of God, God allowed her to be with child and birth the Christ child into the world, but he did not have a sinful nature because he only had a heavenly father as the son of God. Therefore, Christ, yes, he was man, 100%, and yet he was also 100% God. And what's so awesome about that is he lived his life as a sinless person, and then watch this, church, he chose to go to the cross for you. He did not deserve to die. He had not broken the law. He had never sinned. The Bible says he who knew no sin became sin for us. He took my sin. It was my sin and it was your sin that put Christ on Calvary's cross. When he was on the cross, you were on his mind. You say, well, why did he have to die for me? Because God demanded that blood be shed, the blood of his own son, as the atonement, the payment for man's sin. I took a trip this week. I thought I was going through the easy pass lane. And the easy pass wasn't paid up. So it wasn't easy. And the gate didn't rise. And I had to hit the button. That's embarrassing. Yeah, well, it's not paid up. Okay, wow. What do I do? Call my wife, right? Text her. And so I turn around, go back through, come to the cash lane, right? So they wouldn't take easy pass. Cash or credit, card, right? Swipe it, gate goes up. I got through based on the card, but the easy pass didn't work. Why? It wasn't paid. What gets you through the pass or not in order to go into heaven. Only one thing. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanseth us from all sin. Did you hear me on that? If you've never heard scripture, would you let me quote that to you? The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanseth us from all sin. There's only one way to have our sins forgiven. There's only one way we can know we're going to heaven, and that's that moment when we put our faith and trust in Christ alone for our salvation. Now, check this out. God says it's a gift. It's a gift, all right? So, I have flowers here, all right? And I'm going to give flowers here, and... Uh, I'm walking down here. Bob, you want flowers? I don't think so, but your wife might worry. Would you like a flower? All right, here we go. Don't tell my mother I gave that away because we have less on this side now than we did on the other side, and she'll beat me up. But there you go. You can have that flower. Now watch. If that's truly a gift, I didn't say, Bob, give me some money. I gave your wife this flower here. You know, I, I didn't say, hey, you got to shine my shoes. If it's truly a gift, I give it to all 100, and I let her have that. All she had to do was just receive it. You know, the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God wants to give you a home in heaven. God wants to give you eternal life. And all you have to do is be willing 
to admit your sinful condition, which a lot of people are not willing to admit, and repent of your sinful condition, coming to God saying, God, you're right, I'm wrong. You're perfect, I'm a sinner. I'm willing to believe that Bible that says I deserve hell. I don't want to go there. And I believe what that Bible says about your son, Jesus Christ, and I'm willing to trust in Christ alone for my salvation. Now, I'm not going to take the time, so you don't need to get nervous, to go through 20 chapters, 21 are in the book of the Gospel of John, and show you these things that he put in the book that ultimately were designed to bring you to a place of believing. But could I just give you this testimony? In particular about the Gospel of John. My mom, who is, mom, are you in the building? Mother, she's here somewhere. Probably helping with nursery or something. Listen, she was very religious. Very religious, hardcore about her religion. She happened to practice Catholicism. Some of you here today, you're Catholics. And that's what my mom was. I was Christian Catholic. And I'm not here to beat up on Catholics or just beat up whatever religion you are. And some of you are, and that's your background, and I understand. A lot of times people are born into Catholicism through the family, and you're christened like I was, and, and you have all these things. But I don't care if it's Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, name the religion, all right, or even the community church. The thought would be this. What matters is the message of the Word of God. And any body, preacher, priest, I don't care who it is, anybody that's teaching that you can get to heaven by, for instance, being good. If your good outweighs your bad, you're golden. If your bad outweighs your good, then you're in trouble. If anybody teaches that you get to heaven by being good or kind of climbing a ladder of all the religious things that your particular brand says you need to do, that's not going to get you to heaven. Think about this. If we could get to heaven by what we do, why did Jesus have to die? It doesn't even make sense. Why would he come to earth, be nailed to a cross, be literally beat to death? Why would he do that if I could get to heaven by being religious? And my mom, in addition to believing what she believed about Jesus, was that he was the Savior, but she also thought she had to do what she had to do as part of her works and that it was based not just on Christ and his sacrifice, but also on her adherence to her religions, religion and doing her good deeds. And so she began to explore, and my dad and mom at that time in life, my mom was 28, started to get into the Bible. And she had a Bible study. And the preacher said, the Bible says, and she'd say, the church says. And she wasn't talking about his church, that's for sure. And she'd say, the, he'd say, the Bible says, she'd say, the church says. And here's finally what happened. And I'm almost through. You're doing great in listening. Thank you. Don't leave me yet. Here's the thought. He looked at her and said, you need to read the Gospel of John, the same book we're in today, 10 times, and then we'll talk again. On a Saturday night, she knew she was going to church the next morning, was going to go to that preacher's church. And my mom started reading through the Gospel of John. And again, I don't have time to bring you through that whole book right now. But she went through and she started reading through. At 2 o'clock in the morning, on a Saturday night into what was now Sunday morning, my mom came to the place of realizing if she held to her beliefs that did not match the Bible, that she would die with unbelief having been the thing that took her to hell. And if you talk to my mom, she didn't repent of her, you know, drug addiction or whatever. And we're thanking God for people. We have an addictions ministry. If that's where you're at right now, God can help you with that. God can change your life. But here's what literally with my mother, who was so dedicated to religion, she had considered being a nun at whatever point. She was so dedicated to religion, but she saw where it was not Jesus plus anything. It was Christ alone. And in her heart, for her, she had to surrender herself and turn her back on her pride, which would have taken her to hell. I've got this one. This is what I like, and this is what I think, and this is what I've always had. But no, the Bible confronted her. 
And I know some of you may be sitting here today and say, man, this Bible you're preaching, you keep saying Bible, Bible, it's, it's confronting me with something I've not really considered to the degree you're talking about. And, and I'm starting to see some of that because even in me preaching the Bible, God's spirit will work in your heart. You're wondering, what is that? Man, this feels real to me. This actually makes sense to me. I normally just go and check box church, but I, I can feel like this is, there's something to what that man's saying there. It's not because of me. Again, I'm just the mouthpiece. It's the book we're looking at right now and God's spirit that will convince you about the truth of the word of God. He'll convict you about your sinful condition because nobody can raise your hand and say, I'm sinless. That would be a lie. We're all sinners. And if you think about it, we're all hell deserving as compared to perfect God. But he'll convict you of your sins. He'll convince you of the truth. And I'll tell you right now, he'll convert your soul. He'll change you. Instead of being on the way to hell, you can be on the way to heaven. Amen. Now, again, we're in Jersey, man. We roll large. You know, we do what we do. And we're busy. And, you know, we come in and, and just kind of like, I don't know if I want to hear all this stuff. No, watch. If you go to any hospital today... You go to any hospice situation and people, including that those did not plan to be there today, every day here in South Jersey, people are dying. And around the world, people are dying. And when you die, listen, you don't get a second chance to go and I'm going to talk it out with God. God gave you the Bible and Jesus is the truth and you are being given today truth that you ought to act upon. Amen. You say, well, how do I do it? Just like she took that flower, you could take salvation. If you truly believe, that's all that's necessary. We've read it several times in John 20, 31. If you believe that he is the son of God, that he is the Christ, and you're willing to come to a place of I'm wrong, God, you're right. That, that Pastor Clark preached last week about the thief on the cross. You had Jesus in the middle and you had the man to his right who said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that man did not come off of a cross and join a church or get baptized. All he did was say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to that man, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now here's what that meant. He was going to die on that cross, that other thief, but he was going to get to go and be with God. And it wasn't because he joined a church or turned over a new leaf or was a good mom or a good dad or a good husband or a good wife or any of that. No, he was a convict. He was dying as penalty for his crimes, but he put his faith in Christ alone. I'm done the message. When you go back to John 20, 31, and he said... This book is so you can believe that Jesus is the Christ, he's the son of God, and that believing you can have life and through his name. Boy, I love to just talk about for hours the greatness of Jesus Christ. He is amazing. He's real. I wish I could put everybody on planes and we go over to Israel. Say, no, no, they have more there. No, I know, but no. <laughs> but here's the thought. You could go and walk the streets where he walked, land of the Bible. You could go to where he was crucified. And church family, thank God, this is Easter Sunday. You can go to that garden tomb. Up from the grave he arose. Amen. How do you know he's the son of God? Because he's the only one that's not dead, Amen. that walked this earth, and he went to be with the heavenly father, and he's alive. You say, oh, man, I don't believe all that. Again, read your Bible. That's, that's all I'm going to say to everybody here. Read your Bible, and we can help you, and you can learn, and you can understand. So I'm done. Do you want Jesus as your Savior? Do you believe you need a Savior? I mean, really, you. Do you believe you need a Savior to save you from your sins? Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ, that he's the only Savior? Are you sorry for your sinful condition, what you are? Are you sorry for your sins, what you've done? Would you be willing to come to God and put your faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation? Would you be willing to do that? We could pray because the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be saved, could be saved, shall be saved. For whosoever shall call. It means simply crying out to God in prayer and saying, God, I need you. I need you as my Savior, and I want to trust you as my Savior. At the end of every service, we have what we're going to do right now. It's called an invitation. 
an invitation. Say, what do you invite me to? To trust Christ. You know, with an invitation, you can either accept it or you can say, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to be part of that event. I'm not inviting you to an event, but I'm inviting you to receive Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior. Would you be willing to do that? At the end of every service, we have our invitation. And if you need Christ, we can help you to learn how to receive Christ. Carla, did that lady trust Christ today? Eight o'clock service. Joe, both those guys? I preached just like this. I went out in the lobby. I told people. I said, look, if you know you need Jesus, just come up and speak to me. Guy walked up to me and said, I need help. I'm in trouble. He said, I've been watching online for a couple of weeks. The lady, she had been sitting here. She'd raise her hand. Carla got to talk to her. All three people, they put their faith and trust in Christ for salvation. It's the greatest thing. So I'm, it's, I'm a little bit hazy in, in, in understanding. Why don't you let somebody talk to you right now? I can talk to you. We'll do it right here at this altar. We'll have people standing up here. I can never do that. Why? Your pride? Say, bro, don't insult me. No, I'm just being real. Come on. We're, this is New Jersey. We direct talk, right? Everybody okay? The, the thought would be, what be, pri- image? Uh, what, what, what are you going to let take you to hell? I'm not letting my pride take me to hell. I'm telling you right now, I'm trusting Christ alone. If I die and go to heaven, it's not because of me. It's only because of Jesus. Make sense? So we're done. Um, we're going to have our invitation. If you'd like to trust Christ, I'd love to have you get saved and just bury your pride. Jim, raise your hand back here. Bronski. How many years ago? I forget. 33 years ago. Jim walked in on an Easter Sunday. Mm. Easter Sunday. First time visitor. Had his religion. But he chose, after hearing a message, Pastor Clark preached just like this, to receive Christ. You're here today. You could do the same thing. That's 33 years ago. And praise God for it. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you don't mind, please. Please don't leave unless it's an emergency. We're almost through. You've done so great. I know I preached a long time. Thanks for your patience. If you don't mind, just two questions. Angela, you can play. Thank you. This is not a setup. You don't know, you that are guests that have never seen an invitation, don't, don't be nervous. I'm not going to make anybody do anything. Nothing crazy is happening. It's just real simple. Do you want Christ as your own Savior? I don't mean to embarrass anyone, but I wonder, if you're here today, if you were to die, are you sure you'd go to heaven? For a Bible reason. I I don't mean just because you're part of a church or you like to wish your way into heaven, but do you know for a Bible reason? If you don't, if you don't, you could get that settled today. Who would say this? You know, I don't know I'm going to heaven. I'm, I'm concerned about my soul. I need some prayer. I won't come to you. I'm not going to make you stand. I'm not going to call your name out, even if I knew it. But who would say, man, I'm hearing what you're saying, and I, and I believe that Bible, and, I, and I'm not sure I'm going to heaven for a Bible reason. I'm concerned about my soul. And I'm going to pray here in just a moment. If, 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 you, if you want prayer, would you raise your hand? If, you, if that's you, a hand. I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you raise your hand? Who else? Thank you. I see those hands. Who else? I see that hand. Thank you. Appreciate that. Who else? Not sure I'm saved. Not sure I'm going to heaven. I'm concerned. When you have your prayer, include me. Thank you. Appreciate that. Anybody else? Thank you. Appreciate that. I know it takes some courage to raise a hand. I'm going to pray. My prayer doesn't save you, but I'm going to pray that God will give you the courage, the determination to trust Christ today. Father, I pray for those who've raised their hands and those who did not, but know they need to be saved. I pray that the Word of God would be very real in people's hearts right now. I pray that Christ would be clearly seen in their mind's eye and in their heart. And God, I pray that we would be willing to repent of our sinful condition, admit our guilt, and come to Christ alone for salvation. And I pray you'd help us now. 
in just a moment. Some people who have already trusted Christ are going to come here and pray at the front because as a Christian, they're praying about things. They're glad they're a Christian because they love Jesus so much. They want to tell some other people about Christ. They'll come and pray about things like that. But several of you raised your hand, said you're not sure you're going to heaven. I've got men and ladies standing here at the front. They could help you right now. They take the Bible. You can just, we can pray right here. Or if you want, privately off to the side. If you want to speak to someone, either way. We can just help you to pray right here at the altar right now. And you can trust Christ right this second. Or if you want to talk to someone, privately and off to the side, we could also do that. So in a moment when we stand, you'll see some people come forward to pray. If you raise your hand or even if you didn't and you need Christ, I want to challenge you. Forget about all what's going on and what the soup is at the diner and all that kind of talk. And you better concentrate on what God's telling you in your heart today. Father, I pray you continue to help us now in Jesus' name. Let's stand, please, if you're able. If you'd like to come and pray, if you're a Christian, I want to encourage some of you to come. Make it easier for some others. If you'd like to come to Christ. Why don't you come here right now? Talk to one of these people. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, I want you to go. If you're a lady, take the hand of one of these ladies. Speak to them. If you want somebody to pray with you, pray with them. Workers are down here. Talk to people. Let's make sure. Damon, y'all talk to people. Who else needs to come to Christ? Would you come? Would you come? If you need to come to Christ, why don't you come right now? Chad, come on over here in the front, please. Come to Christ. Let's pray. Put your faith in Christ. Come on. I can never go down there like those people. Man, we had a lady before we even started. She walked right out. Rebecca. Come on. Others are coming to Christ. Why not you? Why not you? Why not now? Come on. Be the greatest decision. Some of the men here, I love you. God bless you, my friend, even if I never met you before. I'm, I'm so thankful you came to our church today. My pop was 30 years old when he got saved. Drywall worker, South Jersey, doing what he was doing. And he humbled himself and came to Christ. If that's what you need to do right now, man, I encourage you. Man up. Step out down and come down here and get saved right now. Put your faith in Christ alone. It'd be the greatest decision you've ever made. The greatest decision you've ever made in your life. I promise you that on the authority of the Word of God. On the authority of the Word of God. Anybody at all that wants to get saved, just come on. Maybe just down here praying because you love Jesus. Man, I'm glad. You say, that's a heavy message. I, I know it was. We got a lot of people here. Not everybody here knows they're going to heaven. The resurrection's a celebration, but the greatest celebration is when someone gets spiritually resurrected. They put their faith in Christ. That's an awesome thing. An awesome thing. Wait just a moment longer. For anybody that needs to trust Christ, just give me your chance. If you'd like to come, would you come right now? You know, there's people here, and maybe you could look this way. I'm going to close the service in just a second. I don't know what all you're dealing with, but please hear me. At our church here, this is not, this is not some museum with a bunch of perfect people. This church is a hospital. Man, we come in here, we're all hurting. <laughs> and some of us don't know Christ and we need to get saved. That's the first step. But then after salvation, as a Christian, life's not always easy. And the church, we're here, we want to be a help. When I close in prayer, I'll be in the back. Maybe you raised your hand or didn't, and you're here this morning, you think, you know, I don't know I'm going to heaven. Well, don't walk out of here and leave without getting that settled. I'm going to have these people here that are standing at the front. Y'all can go to the Welcome Center if you don't mind. Get a couple more ladies there just in case. I'll be in the back. If anybody here is just like, man, I need to talk to somebody. 
you, you don't have to be fancy about it. I don't know why you're talking to me. And I'll, I'll be shaking hands and all that. But Pastor Clark, he'll be in the back. Any of us, we'll take time and you can get it settled. And again, if you're brand new, you've never seen any of this, it's kind of like maybe a little mind boggling. It, there's, there's nothing strange. It's just as easy as when I gave her that flower gift. She took it. Here's Christ. Can you see him? On a cross. Bless his holy name. Amen. Shedding his blood for me and for you. If you're struggling with addictions or stubborn habits, we have a Bible-based program called RU, Reformers Unanimous. They meet on Friday night and Sunday mornings. Joel Patterson standing at the back with his hand up. He'll be at the Welcome Center right after the service. If you're in need of help, please see him. Uh, uh, we have a lot of workers that help with RU. We've had a lot of people that have gotten help. It doesn't have to just be drugs or alcohol. It could be any type of addiction that you're dealing with. Please feel free to see Joel at the Welcome Center. If you're watching online, fill out the form at my response, and we'll get somewhere. I don't care where you live in the world. We'll find somebody to help you, which would be great and, and a wonderful thing. If you're a lady here, including first time, if you want to go to the Ladies' Renewal, it's going to be in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, April 11th through the 13th. Jocelyn Trell is going to be the lady speaker on that event. You want to go up on Thursday night, that's fine. If not, you go up on Friday or Saturday, or both, obviously. Um, so that's, that's coming up very, very quickly. My dad will be preaching tonight at 5.30. I had told him preach this morning. He said, I ain't preaching, you preach. So that, and it's not because he doesn't love to preach. He's just very unselfish and wanted me to preach, and I appreciate him being that. Some of you think, man, I thought Pastor Clark was preaching. I know you got stuck with me, but he'll preach at 5.30 tonight, and um, he'll preach. And, and so I know some of you are traveling away and with family and other things on Easter Sunday, but if, if you can possibly be here. If you are a first-time guest, if there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. I sure hope you fill that response card. If you didn't and you're willing to do so when you leave, if you go by the Welcome Center, somebody help me to make sure this is going on back there. Sean Love, will you make sure there's response cards ready? If you didn't fill one of those out and you don't mind, maybe you came in late, give us a record of your visit. We promise we won't stalk you nonstop, but we'd like to have your info. Love to have you come back. Uh, we, we're here in the auditorium on the other side. There's been all kinds of good stuff happening. When you dismiss, I have to read this from my paper for your kids, and some of you have your kids in here, which is great. In our gymnasium, which is out these doors and swing a right, they'll have the candy scramble. I want to make sure I read the directions I was told to read. The sections for each group in gym, as soon as the service is done, the two through five-year-olds, all you mamas hear me please, or, or men if you have your kids here, two through five-year-olds, you pick them up from class and bring them to the gym. Okay, two through five-year-olds, pick them up from class and bring them to the gym. And then first through sixth grade, they will be brought down to the gym from their classes. If you have any in that grade that are here in the auditorium, we want them to be involved, all right? We, they're not going to get stampeded. The guys are up in the air. It's candy if your kids don't eat. We're, we're, the dentists are so happy today in South Jersey, and Solid Rock's doing what it's doing. But it's a fun thing. It takes a couple of minutes. It's not like an hour. When they start throwing candy, these kids vacuum it up. So it will not take long at all, all right? So I'm going to pray. I'll be at the back. I probably am not going to get to shake everybody's hand. My dad will be back there. Others, we're just thrilled that you're here. You guessed, if you came because someone invited you, we are, that you made their day. I have this question. I'm just curious. Did anybody, just the way you heard about the church, was through either Facebook or through a direct mailing? I'm not asking. Did anybody see it and that's why you're here today as a guest? I won't call you out or anything. Anybody with those things? We're just curious. They've, they've been on and I'm just wondering how people are hearing about us. But uh, most of the time, it's because one of our people invited them. Let's pray. And we're done. Thank you. Father, thanks for letting us be in church. And Lord, I thank you for these choir people singing their hearts out. And thank you for the orchestra.